Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. I was just about to say, I got to be honest with you. And it occurred to me that that is one of the stranger phrases, I think, in English, to preface a statement with that. I used to have a guy who worked for me that said some variation of that all the time. Like he'd say, I got to be honest with you. No, you don't got to be honest with me especially if it's going to hurt my feelings. I'd rather you be dishonest with me. Tell me a lie that'll make me feel better. Or he would say, I'm going to be honest with you here. Like now, this is the time you're going to be honest. What about all the times you don't preface it? Are you dishonest with me during those times? The one that I find I say most often is, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, and then it occurred to me, I'm always sort of perfectly honest. I just don't have it in me to lie. I used to. I used to be quite the liar. And maybe that's, maybe that's why I still feel uh, a little obligation to let you know that I'm telling the truth now. I used to be a little bit of a, a dishonest person, a little bit of a shady character. And I think part of that kind of came from my career in corporate America, back when the philosophy was, so long as you make your number, everything else is academic. And I just found that being dishonest sooner or later comes back to haunt you. I feel that sometimes in the short term, being honest can be the hard thing, but in the long term, it's the easy thing, it's the right thing, and it's something that I've really tried to impress upon my children so that they can feel comfortable if they screw up, they can come to me, they can be honest, and we'll work through it. There's a quote from John Lennon that I love. There's a lot of quotes by him that I love, but one of them is, honesty won't always earn you friends, but it will earn you the right friends. I think I got that right. That might, I might have been paraphrasing there, but you get the point. But that was a very long digression. Where I was at here was, I'm tired. In fact, this might be the ideal opportunity for me to grab to my little screen grab for the thumbnail. So I'm just gonna be like, ugh, I'm tired. Hopefully somewhere in there, there's a decent thumbnail. But I'm tired literally, and I'm tired figuratively, and I feel that it's starting to affect my podcasts. In fact, last week, that was a relatively short podcast. 17 minutes generally is right along the bottom end of the length for my podcasts. Usually they're you know, 17 to 22 minutes. I recorded over an hour of footage to get that 17 minutes. While I was editing, there was just, beyond some of the, a lot of the verbal flubs that I make and do my best to edit out, there was a lot that just came off very sour and sort of depressing and kind of whiny. Honestly, I, I felt like I kind of came off as a complainer, and that's not who I am. I am so enormously grateful for so many things, including all of you. Uh, you've really turned my life around by being fans of this channel and supporting this channel through watching. So, as always, thank you for that. But that that last week, the stuff that I recorded, and I've got a list of, of the things, and I, I was thinking, could I try and do them again this week and somehow make them more positive. And I'm not sure that I can. We'll, we'll see. But I just found that in that podcast, my attitude is such a far cry from what it was in some of the podcasts in the spring. I think back then, we were perhaps a little bit all more optimistic that 2020 was going to turn around, perhaps, and not be an entire year of dumpster fire. And I want to make sure that I, I try and keep that tone going because no one likes Eeyore. No one likes that person that brings your spirits down. I don't want to be that person on a Monday morning. I want to be that person that you have a cup of coffee with and you leave feeling better, not leave feeling worse. So while in this podcast, I may touch on a few things that uh, kind of irritate me a little bit, I'll do my best to make sure that they come out at least a little bit positive and, and not just complaining. So I feel like I just digressed a bunch there again. Back to the tired thing. So physically tired, my insomnia, I've talked about this repeatedly. Uh, right now, it is 10.52 in the morning. I've been awake since 2 a.m. I am very, very appreciative of all of you who have shared your tips and tricks for how you've dealt with insomnia. I have tried the vast majority of them. And, you know, no dice. It's, uh, I'm still struggling here. And that physical tiredness coupled with the emotional tiredness that I'm sure all of us are feeling here in this year, it's just, it's been sort of a, a vicious circle. 
So if you're watching this video on Monday, December 7th, the release date, I'm starting sort of an unorthodox protocol today. It's either going to turn out to be a total scam and a waste of money, or it could just you know, change my life. If I start sleeping well again, I think that's going to be just massive in terms of my mood, my health, everything. I will be making sort of a video journal of the whole process so that I can share it with you one way or the other, if it's effective or if it isn't. I also tend to get a little bit down this time of year. I'm just, I'm not a big holiday person. There's a fair amount of history within my family, just drama and things like that that occur around the holidays that have always sort of soured the Christmas spirit for me. One of those things was my dad died this time of year. In fact, if you're watching this on Monday the 7th, this is the day 22 years ago that my dad was buried. So yeah, it's, it's been a while, but it's still something that sort of weighs on me a bit. He died when he was 56, so just a few years older than I am right now. And I was probably on that same path two years ago. So there's a positive thing. There's something to look at and be grateful for. The fact that through keto and some of the other lifestyle changes that I've made, I hope to live a long, long time, quite a few years longer than my dad did. I'm also just not into the commercialization of Christmas. To me, the, the whole present thing, I could care less about. In fact, I feel almost a little bit embarrassed opening presents. I, I don't want any. I feel that I have so much already in my life. I want to live vicariously through watching my grandson open his presents. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking forward to. Now that he's approaching two, I think he gets the whole present thing. For him, opening up the presents and seeing something is really exciting. And I just take so much joy in his joy. So, boom, there's, there's another happy little thing. However, and this is going to be a little bit ranty, my wife put up the Christmas tree and all the decorations before Thanksgiving this year. And that's just, to me, that seems like way too long. We're already listening to Christmas music pretty much nonstop on our Amazon Echo. I've pretty much reached my limit on Christmas music already. And there are some songs that just don't make sense to me. Like, it's the most wonderful time of the year. All right, this, I just, I totally don't get this. There'll be parties for hosting, marshmallows for toasting, and caroling out in the snow. So far, so good. There'll be scary ghost stories. Why? This is, this is Christmas, not Halloween. You were doing so good, Andy Williams, right up until that point. Scary ghost stories? What is this, Krampus? So there you go, there's my little Christmas rant out of the way. Another thing that I am really tired of is news. I really miss the 70s, especially like 70s and 80s. National news was on a half hour a day. And you you had news people. They reported the news. It wasn't a commentary on the news. So Walter Cronkite, he told you the news. And, and it wasn't wall-to-wall -wall politics and despair, which is kind of what I feel it is now. I would love, love, love it if there were some website or something out there, maybe there is, if there is, you can let me know down in the comments below, that's just good news. Tell me stories about rescuing puppies down in a well, or how a local scout troop fixed up a homeless center, or something like that. I would just love some good news on a regular basis, instead of what we're constantly, constantly getting. Now, sometimes I'll talk about some of the especially annoying or nasty comments that I get down in the comment section, typically not on the podcasts. I feel that generally if you're watching the podcast, you're one of my subscribers, one of my regular viewers, someone that's actually interested in hearing me talk for 17 to 22 minutes. So I don't typically see those sort of comments on these videos, but I do see them on all the other cooking videos. You get your standard American diet people who don't really understand keto. You get your vegans, and then you get your sort of police, the ingredient police, keto police, all those sort of people. And I'm not going to talk about any of those comments. I am going to talk about one of the best comments that I've read. And this was from a viewer by the name of Arnie Anonymous. And if I don't get the quote correct, Arnie, I hope I at least paraphrase it well. The comment was, those who know the least know the loudest. And I would say that encapsulates internet comments, not just on my channel, but across the board. 
So if you yourself are ever looking at comments, whether it's on this channel or another channel or somewhere else out on the internet, just rather than get irritated when you see somebody say something that really, really rubs you the wrong way and that you completely disagree with, just remember, those who know the least know the loudest. So I'm not really sure where I want to go with the rest of this podcast. Last night, while I was lying awake in bed, I had thought of all kinds of things. And normally what I do is I'll grab my phone and I'll write them down in my task list so that I remember them. But I thought, oh, I'll remember this. And I don't. I remember thinking, I, I know that there was part of it where I was thinking about, and this may have came from talking about Walter Cronkite, but thinking about growing up in the 70s in South Dakota. And growing up in the 70s in South Dakota was probably a lot like growing up in the 50s elsewhere in the country. That's not to say that, you know, South Dakotans or anyone in the Great Plains are backward. It just took time back then for a lot of things to sort of work their way from the coasts into the center of the United States, which is where I lived. Well, North Center. And I thought about some of the positives and some of the negatives that came out of that time period. The positives, it was just such a sort of carefree time. There's just a lot I miss about it. I miss that corner drugstore, the five and dime, the Ben Franklin store. And now it's just everything is, you know, Walmarts and Walgreens and Target and CVS. And it just doesn't have that warm feel about it. I miss that, especially, you know, in the holidays. You didn't need, you know, cell phone or GPS or tracking devices to figure out where your children were. Parents would just hop in a car, drive through the neighborhood, and wherever they saw all of the bicycles congregated, that's where you knew where the kids were. Nobody locked their door at night. And in fact, things got so cold in South Dakota that in the winter, when you'd go to the grocery store, you would leave your car running in the parking lot, unlocked. That's just the way things were back then. I miss that sort of trust and friendship and community. Some of the things that I don't miss so much, corporal punishment. I don't think I have spanked my children ever. I don't think it's ever been necessary. I think that you can, you can punish and correct a child's actions without violence. But that was not the way back in the 70s. I was on the receiving end of a fair amount of spankings. And I remember them. Whether that was... A wooden spoon, which honestly, not all that bad. It was more, that was, I think, more of a psychological thing. You know, you felt you were getting spanked. I mean, it probably hurt a bit, but compared to like a rubber spatula, wow, that stung. On a bare butt, that was pretty awful. And, and then you've got sort of the humiliation factor of having to drop trow and bend over your mom or dad's knee to take your spanking. It's, it's like, the equivalent of being led to the gallows. Wow, that was awful. Some of the other punishments, too. Um, I got caught playing with matches once, and I was forced to hold a match over the sink so that when I dropped it, it didn't start anything on fire, but hold a match until it burned all the way down to my fingers. Also, people probably in my age group were still in that generation that got their mouths washed out with soap if they said a dirty word. And I was on the receiving end of that as well. I was probably, I don't know, eight or nine, I'm guessing. And I had a dream and I was a sheriff back in the old west. And in the dream, the town that I was a sheriff of had a, a double bad name. It was Effing B. Now, you'll be able to figure out what that means. I, had, I don't know that I'd ever heard those words. But somehow they were in my dream, and I didn't, I didn't even know they were dirty words. It was just, I'm the sheriff of F and B. And the next day, I took a bunch of paper clips and sort of made a, a vest, like a sheriff's vest, out of it. And, you know, put it over, put my arms through it. And I went over to the neighbor's house, my friend Doug. And Doug's mom opened the door and commented on my vest and said, So what are you supposed to be dressed up as? And I said, I'm the sheriff of F and B. And she said, you need to go home. And in the one minute that it took me to get home, Doug's mom called my mom and told her that I had used the F word and the B word. And then I got to taste some ivory soap. One of those little bars. Is it ivory? Is that the one that floats? It's whatever the, the soap that floats. And this was one of those like hotel-sized bars, so it could fit in a nine-year-old's mouth. 
Just think, that stuff used to be commonplace. And I know this has absolutely zero to do with keto, but here is one that does. Margarine. Like, all the stuff that we were told back in the 70s that we should move away from and move to was pretty much wrong. Fat will make you fat. Don't have butter, have margarine. I still think back to margarine and you would leave it out on the counter for too long and it would start to liquefy. The oils would start to separate. I, we should have realized back then that this is gross. This is not real food. Being told that bacon is gonna kill us and eggs is gonna kill us. And I think about some of the cereals and stuff that we used to eat as kids. Back when they put sugar in the product name. It wasn't Super Honey Crisp. It was Super Sugar Crisp. It was Sugar Smacks. It was Sugar Bombs. It was just everything was sugar, sugar, sugar. And it's no wonder that then this sort of eating mentality is carried through many people's lives. And we've got the, the degree of obesity and overweight and diabetes that we have in people of my age, give or take a handful of years. So, come to think of it, not everything growing up was great. As they say, nostalgia, it ain't what it used to be. In terms of last week's Easter egg, it's Stuart from the Minions. Now, I had one viewer thought that perhaps I was trying to give it away when I was talking about, um, what was that movie? Uh, Sacred Cow. When I talked about how we are stewards of the planet, that maybe that was a hint, like steward, Stuart? Nope. Just happenstance, sheer coincidence. So with that, I'm gonna close on sort of a serious topic, I guess, and it's also sort of a flashback topic. So it does fit in a little bit with the earlier topic of nostalgia. I was born in 1968. And if you look back at 1968, that was also a pretty crummy year. There are a lot of parallels, I think, to, to 2020. If you do a YouTube search on the year that was 1968 or, you know, 1968 recap, you'll find a number of videos and there's some good ones out there. There's some that obviously have a political leaning left or right, but uh, get out there, take a look. What you're going to see is it was not a good year. Really sort of started with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Uh, that's when the whole war really started going sideways. You had a lot of anti-war protests, a lot of civil rights protests going on. You had the assassination of Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., the assassination of Bobby Kennedy. There was a, a whole lot of unhappiness. There was a whole lot of not great stuff going on. Then right at the end of the year, it was Christmas time. Apollo 8 was launched and went into orbit around the moon. And there's some question about whether the next part that I'm gonna tell you is true or whether it was just artistic license in the docu-series from the Earth to the Moon. But after the moon orbit, Houston Control read off a number of telegrams to the Apollo 8 crew. There was a telegram from President Johnson, I think maybe some other world leaders, but the final telegram was to Frank Borman, the commander of the Apollo 8 crew. It came not from a president, or other world leader or celebrity, just from an American citizen. And it said simply, thank you, Apollo 8. You saved 1968. I hope that we have a moment like that at the end of this year. The sooner the better. I hope we have something that saves 2020. As always, thank you for spending a little bit of time with me in your day. Thanks for watching or listening.